in 1984. I was in the eighth grade, and I stepped onto the football field for the first time in a helmet and shoulder pads. I'd wanted to play football for years, but you see, I grew up in, in some private schools where we weren't allowed to play football. In fact, we weren't even able to call what we were playing football. We even had to call it the passing game, <laughs> just so insurance would cover it. 1984. I was going to a public school in Texas where football is not merely a sport, it is a rite of passage. And as I stepped out onto that field, I was excited. Not only that I had convinced my mother to let me play this violent sport, but that I was able to go out and learn a new game. I was so passionate. I worked so hard out there, first on the field, last off. Worked out at the school gym with the weights more strenuously than I could have even imagined before I started. I was passionate. I wanted more than anything to be part of the first string starters on the team. So I worked hard. I listened to the coaches, listened to their advice, tried to do everything that they told me. Pushed my hardest, ran my hardest, hit my hardest. Kept control of the ball the best that I could. I was excited to see the advancement I was making. This helmet right here is actually the very helmet that I wore that year. As I look at this helmet, I have mixed emotions. I get kind of nostalgic when I look at the helmet and I see the different scratches and dents and marks. I remember the different games that each of these marks and scratches and dents represent. Some of you are looking at this and saying, I, I knew he was hit in the head at some time in his life, <laughs> and now it's nice to finally figure out when that was. <laughs> but like I said, I have mixed emotions. I'm very nostalgic about this helmet, but the mixed emotions I feel is that as I look at this helmet, there's also deep sadness. Because you see, I never should have had this helmet in the first place. The school provided each of the team members with a helmet, shoulder pads, a uniform. I had a different helmet to start out the season. But while I began this season and I worked really hard, what I didn't realize is that there was another player who was very upset. Because the position on offense, running back, that the coach had assigned me to was the position that he wanted. And the coach had placed him on defense. He took that as a slight. And so during practice, one day early in the season, he talked a few of the other teammates on defense to taking a cheap shot on me. One guy dove and did a chop block into my knees, while two other guys from either side dove as hard as they could head first into my helmet. It was a very violent play, which resulted in my original helmet being cracked down the middle and the right side of the face mask being ripped off completely. I recall as I lay there trying to recover and blink the cobwebs away from my mind, I recall seeing that teammate who was jealous of the position that the coaches had placed me in, and I, I remember the look of satisfaction on his face and the smile as he jabbed your mouth's bleeding. And I'll never forget the sounds of another player who had hit me from the side yell, get off the field. I went home that afternoon. My parents took me to a sporting store, and we bought this helmet with a lot more padding on the inside so my mom would allow me to keep playing. But that next afternoon, as I walked onto the field again and pulled this very helmet on my head, I saw the world a bit differently. I saw the game quite a bit differently. And I saw my team very differently. What makes a team? What is a team? Because until that moment, I was under the impression that the opponents wore different colored uniforms. Easy to spot. Easy to identify. Those are the people that will take cheap shots and wish that you don't have any success. 
Up until that moment, I didn't realize that the same guys in the green and white uniforms that I wore were people that I need to be cautious of as well, and to watch my back, and to observe their motions and their emotions to know who my friend was and who my enemy was. Since that time, I've played many sports, many different sports and on many different teams, and that feeling and that sense of a loss of teamwork, a loss of unity carried over to many of the teams I played on. And the question I want to ask you today is, what kind of team are we on? What feeling do you get as you enter into the experience with people who might be wearing some of the same uniform type clothes that you're wearing today? Because I realized that day, just because I was on the same side of the field, it did not necessarily mean that I was on a team. Just because we wore the same uniforms, it did not constitute that we were on the same team. Just because we shared points did not mean we were on the same team. Just because we shared the same playbook did not constitute a team. Cooperative activity does not constitute unity. That's right. Just because we, as a team, are active together, it does not mean that we are united. And that's what I want to talk about today. As we continue into this series of one, what does it mean to be united in Christ? What did Jesus mean in his prayer in John chapter 17? Pastor Randy Roberts just knocked the ball out of the park at the very first uh, message of this series. When he shared Jesus' prayer request at the very beginning of this prayer, the final closing prayer that we have on record that Jesus prayed just before going to the trial and the crucifixion. We started out looking at Jesus' great desire to be united with the Father. And last week, we looked at Jesus' desire that his leadership, his disciples, would be united together and be united with him and the Father. And today, we take a look at the third, the final part of Jesus' prayer, where he turns his attention to the disciples of the disciples of the disciples, the people of the future. He prays for all believers the people who would be brought in by the original disciples and the people who would be brought in by them as well. Jesus is praying for us in the future. And he has a prayer request. That's right, Jesus has prayer requests for us too. It's not just about us praying to him, but he had a request that his believers would be one even as he and his father were one. And I love where Jesus goes in the prayer, especially in verse 23 of ch chapter 17, where he says, May they experience such a perfect unity that the world may know that you sent me and that I love them and you love me. Wow. Jesus' prayer request for us, all believers today, is that we may experience such a perfect unity that the world will know. I've been reading a, a story not too long ago about something that happened in the 1750s. The British and the French were fighting in Canada. And the British Navy had asked their admiral, Admiral Phipps, to bring his ships off the coast of Quebec and to wait until the ground troops arrived, and then to support the ground troops when the signal came. It happened that Admiral Phipps ended up getting his, his ships to their location a little bit early. And while he sat there with his ships, he began to become annoyed by the statues of the saints that lined the cathedral near the coastline. He decides to tell his men fire the cannons at as many of those saints as you can. Blow them up. And so the ships began firing 
shell after shell, and we don't know the precise number of statues that were destroyed or exactly how many shells were fired, but we know one thing, that when the British ground troops came and they asked for support, that unfortunately the ships were of no help because they had expended all of their ammunition shooting at the saints. Today, I ask us a question. As God calls us into his service, he says, I need you for something important. Have we expended all of our ammunition shooting at the saints? Jesus called us all to oneness of unity. The enemy is not within. The enemy is without So the question we have to ask today is how do we in any way or in some fashion find that unity, that oneness that Christ was praying for? How do we answer Jesus' prayer request? It's said that you can map out the solution with a simple inverted cone where God is at the top of the cone, the pinnacle, and mankind is at the base. And as mankind draws closer and draws nigh to God, we naturally will draw closer to each other. And at that moment that we become one with God, in relationship with God, it is at that moment that we also become one with mankind and touch each other deeply with the oneness of love. In July 2002, a great fight took place in a place that is traditionally known in Jerusalem as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is a church that's believed to be over the cave in which Jesus Christ's body was laid after the crucifixion. The problem happened when a Coptic Christian moved his chair into the shade on the rooftop of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The fight happened, and you need to understand some background information, because in 1752, to try to ease some of the conflict between the six different groups of Christians who presided there at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, that was, that was the Latins, the Greek Orthodox, the Armenian Orthodox, the Syrian Orthodox, the Coptics, and the Ethiopians. The Ottoman Sultan in 1752 decided to resolve some of the territorial issues by assigning specific parts of the temple to each of these six groups. In 1752, he assigned it to the Ethiopians. But then in the 1800s, the Ethiopians were struck by a ravaging illness. And at that time, the Coptics decided that they were going to claim territory to the roof. And from that time in the 1800s till 1970, the Coptics staked their claim. Until in 1970, when they went on a little trip, the Ethiopians took the roof back. And then we find ourselves on a Monday in July of 2002, when a Coptic Christian moves his chair on the rooftop into the shade. Harsh words were exchanged, which turned to pushes, which turned to shoves, which turned into punching, which turned into an all-out brawl. That day, 11 monks were injured. One was sent to the hospital unconscious. An arm was broken. Chairs were thrown. Iron bars were thrown. And the world around looks and says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples. (laughs) It's a relevant text because John 13, 35 literally happened just a few hours before Jesus' prayer in John 17. Jesus says, by this will all men know that you are my my disciples if you love one another. And yet the example to the world that we give is that we're no better off than they are. In fact, we might be worse off. Thomas Manton, the theologian, said that it is this divisiveness that breeds atheism. It is our fault. The fact of the matter is God never called us to protect our territory. God commissioned us to grow his territory. 
God did not call us to make policies. He called us to make disciples. He didn't ask us to criticize. He asked us to baptize. He didn't ask us to judge. He called us to love. Jesus, in his wisdom, in his commission, he did not call us to be a dwindling group of remnant that shrunk to nothingness. He called us to be a united team of people grouping together and growing until we took over the ends of the earth with the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ died, rose again, and he's coming again for us. But today we find ourselves in a world of division, not knowing who our true teammates are even within our own team. As I was preparing for this sermon series over the past couple of weeks, I, I had a question one morning when I was having my devotions, a question that came into my mind of, are we really balanced in our perspective of Satan's schemes today? Because as I hear the news every now and then, I hear of persecution happening throughout the world. And so doing a, a little research, I found a, a website that has cataloged Every Christian uh, killing by those who have been targeted, by those who wanted to kill them specifically just because they were Christian. And they've cataloged this all the way back to September 11, 2001. As I looked at it this past week and I started reading through, I found 99 specific attacks on people just because they were Christians. 99 specific attacks, and out of those 99 specific attacks, within the past 12 months, 1,029 precious Christian souls have been killed. I will not share with you today, because we don't have time, all 99, if you want, it's an easy, easy Google search, or I can give you the website after the service. But I want to share with you just a few of the 99 events that have taken place just in the past 12 months, from today, 12 months back, in what is happening in the world while we sit here comfortable in our pews. Just one month ago, August 25, 2015, in the Central African Republic, in a series of reprisal attacks targeting Christians, militant Muslims hack and shoot some 20 people to death. In July 28, in, in Nigeria, 29 innocent people are slaughtered in raids on three Christian villages. In July 5, while we're at uh, GC, discussing very important issues. In Nigeria, Islamists return to the scene of an earlier massacre and shoot nine survivors in, ad in addition to burning three, excuse me, 30 churches and 300 homes. Same day in Nigeria, a woman, a priest, and two children are among six killed when a suicide bomber detonates during a church service, also wounding 43. May 24, 96 are confirmed dead following a church burning spree by militants. May 19 in Nigeria, Fulani terrorists massacre 27 residents in overnight attacks on two Christian villages. May 4, 30 Christians are massacred by Fulani terrorists. May 2, women and children comprise the bulk of 13 Christians cut down by militants in Nigeria. It's the same day in Nigeria, Muslim terrorists shoot 17 Christians to death. The same day, same place, 27 Christians are slaughtered by Muslim raiders at a church. In Libya, April 19, the Islamic State releases a video showing the brutal execution of 30 captured Ethiopian Christians, at least a dozen of whom are beheaded. April 16, off the shore of Italy, near Sicily, in the Mediterranean Sea, a dozen Christians on a refugee boat are sorted out and thrown to their deaths into the Mediterranean Sea. April 2, in Kenya, a handful of devout Muslims storm a Christian college, separate out the non-Muslims, and ex execute 150 in cold blood and wound 79. March 15, Fulani terrorists massacre nearly 100 Christian villagers, mostly women and children. March 15, in Pakistan, targeted suicide bombs near two churches leave 17 worshipers dead and wound 70. Syria, February 26, 15 Christians taken hostage earlier in the week are executed, including a woman who is beheaded. February 20, in the Central African Republic, 16 Christians are massacred by a Muslim bomb. Some are decapitated. February 14, while we celebrated Valentine's Day, in Libya, 21 Christians are abducted by Islamists, forced to their knees, and then beheaded. 
December 2, in Kenya, Islamists slaughter three dozen Christian quarry workers after separating them from Muslims. Several are beheaded. November 29, in Nigeria, 40 are reported killed when Islamists ride motorbikes into a Christian town and fire indiscriminately at fleeing residents. November 22, in Kenya, religion of peace proponents stop a bus, single out and slaughter 28 non-Muslims, including nine women, after identifying them as Christians. On October 23 in the Central African Republic, 30 Christians are massacred by Islamist extremists. October 19, Nigeria, 31 people, including two pastors, are massacred in church by terrorists. October 10, Nigeria, Fulani terrorists burned down a church and killed seven people, including a pregnant woman. And today, right now, tens of thousands of refugees are running for the hills to any country that will accept them to escape the persecution. It's all over the news. You've seen it. And we sit here today arguing about are you a liberal or are you a conservative? Do you eat dairy products or not? It's a test of fellowship. Do you dress this way or not? Would you allow certification of a certain gender to stand on the platform and preach the good news of Jesus Christ? My friends, we are not united. While the world around us is showing the signs of the end. Today we sit here and we argue about the trivial. I always wondered in college when I was studying eschatology, the study of the last events, why there was such a contradiction. Because in some places I would read that in the time of the end you would know because you'd have to run to the hills. There would be a test of fellowship. We talked about it. People would hold a gun to your head and say, will you denounce your faith in Jesus Christ? We're ready for that. We call that the big time of trouble, right? But at the same time in studying, I, I also read that the time of the end would be like the days of Noah, which people ate and drank, and we just did not care. There was an apathy. There was a Laodicean attitude amongst the crowd where they were asleep, and they were surprised at the coming of the Lord because they didn't see the signs. My friends, today I understand why there is this apparent contradiction in Scripture. Because while we remain divided over the trivial, incredible signs of God's soon coming are happening in the world. My question is, how important is it for us to, to really spend all of our time on the issues that we are currently focusing on, and why aren't we spending our time looking at these issues, supporting our brothers and sisters who are in lands that they are, in fact, indeed engulfed in a, in a great, great time of trouble. I have to admit that this time of trouble is not necessarily just the enemy's fault. We bring it on, on ourselves. If you go through and, and you read how many of these attacks are retaliation, you'll understand that in parts of the world, we are just as fundamental as our enemies. My question is, are we that fundamental here in the States where we are more willing to kill off those that don't agree with us than to bring them into the fold and say, we are united, we are one, and we are not letting you go? There is a motivational speech that's used quite often in many locker rooms, regardless of the sport, as long as it's a team sport, there is a motivational talk that many give. It has different variations but they all pretty much go the same and somewhat like this. You might see, as you're watching sports, whether it's junior high, high school, college, or even the pros, you might see the players have a little five-inch length of rope. Most likely, you'll see it at the end of a keychain dangling out of the pocket of the athlete. Coaches give each of their players a short piece of rope, and they challenge them, hold the rope. And so all season, the players are challenged. Keep this rope with you at all times, and as you see it, rem remind yourself, hold the rope. And then they go on to explain. Imagine if you were at the end of a rope, dangling thousands of feet from the top of a cliff. And there is one person at the other end of that rope holding on. Who would you want to be on this end of the rope? 
They challenged the people in the locker room, look around. Who do you know on your team that regardless of the pain, the burning of the rope on the hands, the scarring that they will acquire, the bleeding, who do you know despite the tired exhaustion that will set in that will never let go of your rope? Who do you know on this team that will hold the rope? If you can point to one, if you can point to two of your teammates, that's not enough because they might not be there when you need them to hold the rope. It is only when you can look around the room and every single person on your team, you know they would hold the rope regardless of the pain, the scarring, the bleeding, the exhaustion. They will never let go. They will always hold the rope. When we get there, we will have unity. But then I want to take it a step farther. Because as you look around... The person next to you, would they hold your rope? If it's your spouse, they're nodding their head. Yes, and if you're a spouse, definitely nod your head. Yes, dear, I will hold your rope regardless. If there's another person in here that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if they're on the other end of that rope, they would hold that rope. It's still not enough. It is not until we can look through this entire congregation and know that every single person here would hold your rope that we're beginning to understand what unity is. But can I preach a little bit harder to you today? Because there are people here that might be coming to your mind right now that you're like, boy, I, I, don't, I don't think they'd hold my rope. We got a bit of history. I can see them at the end of the rope saying, Stinks to be you. Whoops. <laughs> but I want to preach to you today because I want to ask, would you hold the rope? Knowing what you know about them, would you hold the rope? Regardless of the pain and the exhaustion and the bleeding and the scarring, would you hold their rope? Because until we can get there, we are not united. Until regardless of your earthly feelings about someone... Until you can get past those feelings, you can't hold the rope. But I, can I take it one, one more step farther? Preach it, brother. Thank you. You're going to heaven. <laughs> I love you. The fact is that all of us have counted... Since the day we were converted, we have counted on Jesus Christ holding the ropes. No matter what the cost, no matter what the pain, no matter what the exhaustion, Jesus held our ropes while he was being nailed to a tree, while his hands were bleeding and being scarred. He held the rope, despite the fact that the people who should have been there, us, his supporters, were gone. The only people who remained were spitting and hurling, hurling insults at him, and he held on to the rope. He never let go of the rope. We are a people of God, and we were called to be the imitators of Christ. Not in the externals, but on the internals. The internals that say, I will hold the rope. Even for those who hurl insults at me, I will hold the rope. Jesus is challenging us today. He has a prayer request. May they experience perfect unity so the world will know. Will you answer Christ's prayer request? Don't ignore his prayer request. I know sometimes you feel like God's ignoring yours, but he never does. And so we can't ignore his request. Experience that perfect unity and hold the rope.